Watch this. This late in the legislative session might seem like an odd time to tackle a big ticket item like property taxes, but a couple of lawmakers have a bold idea that just might get some attention. What if we just got rid of property taxes? A sitting Idaho representative with far right and extremist ties could be getting sued. A motion filed in court today claims he harassed and defamed a political activist. They're involved in the chain of life, in the, you know, the circle of life. Nez Perce tribal members are hitting the reset button on the circle of life as a culturally significant and historic species is reintroduced after more than a century. Do something about property taxes. That's the charge that Idaho lawmakers have been given from the people of Idaho, at least over the last couple of years in the last legislative session. As many of you are aware, property tax rates skyrocketed in some parts of Idaho, mostly because of the increasing home prices. Some argue Idaho is a victim of its own success, with so many people wanting to move here. But some Idaho legislators have come up with a bold idea to address it. They're pitching a new bill that essentially gets rid of a lot of property taxes. This, of course, comes with a trade-off. Here's Joe Paris. There's a big new idea at the Idaho State House: Eliminate property taxes to help Idahoans struggling to keep up with them. House Bill 741 would remove all property taxes other than voter approved bonds and school levies from primary residences that receive the homeowner's exemption. The bill would also raise the grocery tax credit from $100 to $175 per person. It would also increase sales tax 1.85%, with a portion of that increase going to local taxing authorities who currently collect property taxes. It will help keep people in their homes in Idaho. It'll help our elderly, it'll help people who are trying to buy a new home. It does shift the burden a little bit over to the sales tax, but it's a tax you can avoid if you choose to. House Majority Leader Republican Representative Mike Moyle is co-sponsoring the bill. He says the idea is to shift taxes in a manageable way for homeowners struggling with property taxes. Think about your grandmother. She's not spending a whole lot in sales tax. Now all of a sudden her, her, her uh, property taxes are going to go on 80 percent, 70, 80 percent. That's huge to them. Critics argue the idea is unfair to people who don't own homes but will still see their sales tax go up. Uh, critics have said in committee and outside of committee that what about renters? This doesn't really help renters out at all. How would you respond to that? Renters are in a bad place because they're price takers. And right now we don't have enough rentals, which is one of the reasons prices are so high on rentals. But it does help renters. They get an increase in the, in the credit. They get another $75 for each one of them there. If it's a family of four, you know, add it up, 100, 300 bucks. They also will get the, the added benefit. If they choose to buy a home, it will be easier for them to buy a home because their purchasing power goes higher now that they're not paying all that money for property taxes. It's people's taxes and people's mortgages in some cases will go down several hundred dollars a month. And if the mortgage goes down, you can more easily afford a home. So it does help renters, too. The Idaho Center for Fiscal Policy released their report on the idea, sharing concerns about the concept. The report highlights, among other points, that this could be a tax hike of potentially hundreds of dollars, but with no reduction in housing costs for some Idahoans. The report concludes, quote, we do not support House Bill 741 due to its negative impacts on low and moderate income Idaho families and overall disparate approach to property tax relief. Moyle says he understands concerns, but argues it is a net benefit for most Idahoans. In the spirit of transparency and education on the bill, Moyle says they're working on a tool that Idahoans can use to see how the idea would impact them individually. And we're going to try to get a website on, online so people can go put in their property taxes, and it'll show them what it saves and what they'll get back from the increased credit and from the lowering of the property taxes. So people can understand it's going to put more money in most people's pockets, hundreds of dollars in some cases a month. I think a big question people will be thinking when we show the story is, okay, so if it's going to shift X, Y, and Z ways, who's left holding the bag? Who's this going to end up negatively impacting? I think, you know, who's, who's ever making this, the purchase on sales tax? Are you going to go buy a Mercedes or are you going to go buy a Honda? What, do you, what kind of, you know, where are you? Your spending habits will determine who's, who's going to pay the bill. And another thing that people don't realize with sales tax, we are a destination state. There are a lot of people that come here to recreate. Uh, I have friends who have Airbnbs here, and there's people in those things every weekend that come here for a week or two or a month, and they're paying, they're paying sales tax, and they're paying sales tax on the stuff they buy when they're here. They're paying sales tax on that Airbnb when they're here. They are paying the tax. The best tax is one somebody else pays. All right, Joe, two questions for you. Do the numbers add up on this thing, first of all? 
Yeah, so I was talking to Representative Moyle clearly about that, and I said, you know, the cities and counties are, you know, they get a lot of money from property taxes. Is this going to make them whole? Is this going to maintain their budgets? And Representative Moyle tells me, yes, the way that this is set up, the cities and counties will be getting enough money to power their budgets, and there will also be money put away from them. Uh, they, they know that they have to keep the cities and counties whole. They can't just take property taxes away. There needs to be an added benefit. Uh, the second question, Brian, I'm assuming you're going to ask is, will it pass this session? And that's a major question. And when Talking to Representative Moyle, he tells me, you know, he thinks he could get this through this session. He thinks that there could be enough interest to really get it through. But as you highlighted, Brian, it is late in the session. And Representative Moyle told me that one of his biggest concerns about the legislation is that it is very complicated. And sometimes when things are complicated, by habit, people will vote no. So the idea he has with the transparency and the tool to show Idahoans exactly what this would do in practice, he's hoping that over the next several months, there'll be an education pr uh, progress. And uh, at really next year, this could be a, a big idea, 2023. Yeah, it seems like a simple idea, but yeah, it is complicated. I'm sure all 105 of our lawmakers would have questions about it. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Republican Representative Chad Christensen is not a new name or face to the 208. In the last year of his first term representing District 32, the lawmaker from Eastern Idaho has done and said some controversial things in and out of the statehouse, even making national news at times. Christensen openly and proudly states in his legislative bio he is a member of the far-right militia movement, the Oath Keepers, the anti-government extremist group with several members and leaders who were arrested in connection to the U.S. Capitol riot. Remember that? Christensen also proudly boasts his high Idaho Freedom Foundation index score. We did a whole story on that ranking a couple of weeks ago and its influence over what gets done at the State House. So we're talking about Christensen again, this time for a motion filed in Bonneville County this morning, naming the lawmaker, accusing him and others of defamation, civil conspiracy, fraud and harassment. All right, Morgan Romero is here to talk about this a little bit. Morgan, the guy behind this lawsuit, Gregory Graff, mm -hmm. he's a political activist, right? Yeah. And so this goes back years, and as you said, and it made it clear when we talked about this, it's yeah. pretty messy. It is. It gets messy, and I should mention, it's important to note, what was filed today, this motion is the first step toward filing a lawsuit, so Graff and his attorney have to ask the court for permission because Christensen is suing Graff. That lawsuit, initiated last spring, is still pending. Christensen isn't the only one named in Graf's lawsuit. Graf also plans to sue Idaho Freedom Foundation Vice President Dustin Hurst, Idaho Second Amendment Alliance founder Greg Pruitt, and Christensen's boss at an insurance agency, Emily Robinson. I hope you guys are keeping track of this. Graf claims they took part in an elaborate scheme and he was set up. For background, Christensen sued Graf for defamation last year. He alleges Graf tried to get him fired from his job at State Farm in 2020 by sharing information about him with his boss, Robinson. For a few years now, Graf has been very critical of Christensen, IFF, and lawmakers who score highly on that index we mentioned. Graf launched a website called Idaho Conservatives. You can see it right there. Published articles about far-right lawmakers and helped elect GOP candidates to beat them. These court records show Robinson asked Graf for intel on Christensen, and she was recording their phone call. Graf and his attorney allege Christensen conspired with her to record that call, helping his boss set it up. And then the recording was given to Greg Pruitt and Dustin Hearst. They then published these articles online, blasting Graf. Graf alleges they tried to get him fired from his job, interfered with his ability to make a living, defamed him, harassed him, and doxed him and his family. I'm having to defend my personal reputation. The strain this put on me and my career was insane. And it wasn't right. So they can throw whatever they want at me, and I will not concede. I will not stop defending what is right in this case. So when that happens, when someone fights back, their confrontational playbook tells them, well, you have to double down, right? So that's what they did. They continued to double down and it just got worse and worse and worse. Big picture, Graf points to these tactics as a major reason why many elected officials in Idaho are stepping away from public office. We've been covering this for so long now. He and influential political leaders that Brian and myself have talked to say that's the goal. It's intentional so that these groups get who they want in office and who they can influence. Because they're, that small group is very loud and obnoxious and harmful, um, People pay attention and they are afraid. So my goal in all this is help people to not be afraid of these confrontational tactics. Because once you understand them, once you call out the abusive behavior and you expose it, 
they lose their power and their ability to intimidate. And that's, that's my end goal. I want Idaho to be a wonderful place for all of us. And this horrible, nasty behavior, it needs to end. Yeah, that's the big effort there. I reached out to Pruitt, Hearst, and Christensen. Since the suit was just filed this morning, Pruitt says he wasn't served any papers, and his attorneys say they can't see any public documents. He wrote, quote, apparently the media gets to know about the lawsuit before I do and has documents that I don't have and my attorney doesn't have. Therefore, I cannot comment on the suit. That's understandable. However, Christensen told me he wasn't interested in commenting, and Hearst did respond to me via email. He said he's not interested in playing, quote, Graf's game, calling him an unhinged political operator, saying he, quote, waited till an election year to file it. It's very obvious what's happening, Hearst said. Graf's attorney says they have a hearing on this on April 28th when they plan to formally file that lawsuit, Brian. Okay, uh, so the question to you, Morgan, we didn't do anything when Christensen filed the lawsuit against Graf. Why is this something that we're looking into? Why is this important? Yeah, and, and he touched on it in some of those sound bites, but I think it goes back to media did cover this when it happened. You know, Post Register, Spokesman Review, a lot of people had articles about this online when Christensen filed against Graf. Yeah. But a, a big reason we're focusing on this and we're talking about it now is Representative Chad Christensen is a sitting lawmaker. He serves in the House of Representatives. And the fact that this again is, is against multiple other players that have a stake in politics in Idaho. All right, we'll keep following, obviously, yeah. see what they have to say when they actually see these papers. Yeah, All right, exactly. thanks, Morgan. Yeah, you bet. Representative Christensen is one of the lawmakers up for re-election this year. And like many, he's already filed, but the deadline to file is Friday, by the way. This is your reminder. Tomorrow is a pretty important deadline for those not running for office, too, but those who want to vote in the May primary. If you plan to vote for the Republican ticket, you have one more day to make sure you are registered as one. Unless, of course, you haven't registered at all, then you can register now or you can register day of, which would be May 17th. Or if you plan to vote in the Democratic primary, you don't really have to do anything yet either. But if you are registered Democrat and you want to switch sides for the primary, then that deadline applies to you, which is tomorrow, because Idaho Republicans have a closed primary election. If you are registered as a Republican on a primary election day, you'll get a Republican ballot. If not, you can register on election day with a Democratic Party or choose to vote unaffiliated, meaning your ballot will only have a few options on there for nonpartisan positions like judges. But you will not be able to change your affiliation at the polls, so keep that in mind. And once the primary is over, it won't matter anyway what your registration is because we're all going to get the same general election ballot. However, there could be another wrinkle to Idaho's Sharpay election rules. There's a bill in the legislature right now that would require all voters to affiliate by tomorrow. It's already passed the House, and it is an emergency clause attached to it, meaning if it passes the Senate and signed by the governor, it would go into effect immediately. But how that would affect Friday's deadline, obviously it would be too late, so who knows? We do know, though, you can register to vote, or you can change your affiliation right now online at VoteIdaho.gov. For generations, the Nez Perce survived on salmon caught in North Idaho rivers, but it's been several generations since they've been seen in the Sweetwater Creek. They're not only a keystone species for the tribes of the Northwest, we rely heavily on them with our culture, our ceremonies, and it, it's our basic food. This season, they're back after a century's absence, but the tribe is worried they may not be here to stay. You know, we're not going anywhere anytime soon, and that leaves plenty of time for you to jump in on the 208 conversation. Text us your comments, your questions, and your criticisms. 208-321-5614 is the number. Your name and the hashtag the 208 are the criteria. So is being clever, clean, and concise. And stick around to the end of the show. We could share yours.
Every year, the Nez Perce tribe gets a share of the salmon raised in Idaho hatcheries to refurbish the rivers around where they live. This year, though, was a significant one because this year they spent hours releasing hatchery fish, the Spring Chinook, into the Sweetwater Creek for the first time in nearly a century. The Sweetwater Creek runs through Lapway and feeds the Sweetwater River. And while it was an exciting day yesterday, tribal members say they would have never been without Chinook in that creek in the first place if it wasn't for the Lewiston Dam. Here's Katya Stepovic. The bells were rung. <laughs> Ceremonies sung by tribe members. <laughs> Shortly after, 200,000 juvenile spring Chinook tagged, tracked, and off they go into Sweetwater Creek. It's a ceremonial happy moment when we stock, stock those streams. But at the same time... It's also sad that there were a recent point where we have to. Since the Lewiston Dam was built on the Clearwater River in 1927, tribe members say the dam did not have adequate fish passages, forcing fish to be pushed upstream of the dam, most of them not surviving. It was man-made, man-made you know, obstructions that had wiped out natural, the natural returning fish and genetics. After the dam was removed in the 1970s, fish were reintroduced through hatchery programs. But wild spring Chinook haven't returned to the creek because of a lack of water and poor habitat. It's kind of a sad, sad state that um, we're relying heavily on, on hatchery fish for spring Chinook. Um, but our intent is to provide hatchery fish for tribal harvest and non-tribal harvest. We're, we're hoping that some of these fish will escape past those harvest opportunities and actually start spawning naturally in the streams. Over the years, the tribe has worked to reconnect the creek to its original floodplain and installed in-stream structures that created cool water flows, which is why this is able to happen. It's important for a number of reasons. They're, they're not only a keystone species for the tribes of the Northwest, we rely heavily on them with our culture, our ceremonies, and it, it's our basic food. Uh, but also they're, they're, uh, they're involved in the chain of life, in the, you know, the circle of life. They, they provide nutrients when they die to the stream, to the macroinvertebrates, the bugs, the eagles, the birds. And once you interrupt that and you let that go, then you've impacted the whole you know, the whole life cycle of other animals. While many Nez Perce tribe members are happy Spring Chinook are back in the waters once again, they mourn the loss of wild, natural Chinook and are not optimistic that they will ever return. To be honest, it's the dams, it just is. And that would uh, provide the, the most impact the quickest, um, whether that be, you know, providing a channel around them for fish to come around and not go through turbines and, you know, and go actually through the concrete structure. But that would be the biggest impact we could do right now. All right, now let's talk about sustainability and what the future holds for these fish in this creek. The journey for salmon from the ocean to these rivers is about three to 400 miles. And because of climate change and the presence of dams, some say wild salmon will never return to these creeks and rivers. So hatchery fish will have to be released every so often to keep that population thriving in these areas. But that's going to require more funding from federal agencies, which Keller tells me is a constant struggle right now. Has been for years. And speaking of federal funding and those dams mentioned by Scott Keller, Katya, they've been there for decades. But last year, Idaho Congressman Mike Simpson, he made the bold proposal to get rid of them all in a plan he calls the Columbia Basin Initiative. We could take hours breaking down the benefits and the difficulties in doing that, but it is worth mentioning. Simpson's proposal would require $33.5 billion in federal money to breach those dams by 2030. It would also have to replace the transportation, the irrigation, and the power generated by those dams. Simpson says that funding could come from President Biden's multi-trillion dollar infrastructure package.
You know, with the weather, March is supposed to come in like a lion. But with the Big Sky Tournament in Boise, March comes in more like an eagle or a hornet or a bangle or a bobcat, even a vandal. The men's and women's basketball tourney taking over Idaho Central Arena this week. And there are a few local kids playing for other teams in the conference besides the local teams. So you can go if you want to check it out. A couple more days left. Unfortunately, the Idaho Vandals and the Idaho State Bengals have both been bounced from both brackets. But despite that, Idaho's still making some noise on the court. That is Benny, the Idaho State Bengal on the drums being cheered on by the Portland State Viking and the Weber State Wildcat. And that happened the other morning down there at at uh, Idaho, or excuse me, Idaho Central Credit Union Arena. Of course, of course they're playing Eye of the Tiger, right? That's what, of course, they're playing. Games tonight continue and tomorrow with champions being crowned both Friday and Saturday. And speaking of possible champions, Boise State men's basketball team moving on to the next game of the Mountain West Tournament, but just barely. Nevada Wolfpack missed a last second shot. The Broncos advance 71 to 69. Our sports team, Jay Tust and Will Hall, are in Vegas right now, and they're going to be recapping the game and bringing you the latest later tonight. All right, we're going to get to some of your comments here at the end of the show. You sent it during the show here. Going to load them up here on the screen and get to some of those. We've got a lot of people sending in comments about the tax bill or getting rid of the, uh, excuse me, getting rid of property taxes to increase sales tax to cover the loss there as a way to address property taxes that have been kind of a worry for a lot of Idahoans. 
This is a question we got sent in from uh, Boise, Jeremy in Boise. So people with 3,000 acre ranches or $5 million homes would pay no property tax, same as someone living an eighth of an acre and a thousand square foot home. Sounds like this bill favors the wealthy and our legislators are looking to please those who can make big campaign contributions. It's a good point. We've heard that a couple of times. Won't this sales tax increase for property tax rate be put under pressure on Idaho businesses on the Oregon border? Asked Rick. That's true. Uh, with a lot of the property taxes kind of dropping around there, that would make that a big problem, right? Brian, make no mistakes or make mistake. Actually, the property tax going or sales tax going up. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. The tax bill is another attempt to make Idaho cities beg the legislature for more money every year. We've watched how they treat universities and schools, says Bev. House Bill 741, thanks, Mike Moyle. You'll have us all on bicycles, not Mercedes and Hondas, says Pat, because he says, well, you just buy the cheaper car then if you don't want to pay the sales tax to avoid also paying the property tax, apparently. All right, that's the end of our list, but that's all we have to say. A lot more comments coming in. A lot of people appreciate Morgan bringing that story on uh, Gregory Graff filing a lawsuit against Representative Chad Christensen. That's something that we are going to continue to follow because there's certainly more developments to come along with that. And as those come in, we'll be sure to pass them along to you. And I really appreciate everybody kind of sending in their comments. Couldn't get to them all. But uh, this is kind of part of the show. We like to keep this conversation going. If you have more, send them along. It could be something we address tomorrow. So we look forward to reading them. And you know what? We look forward to answering them as well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.